The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the Eastern Shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. Today's episode is sponsored by JFM Enterprises, providing distinctive ready-made and custom frames and moldings to the trade since 1974. Visit jfm.net to view their catalog of designs. I know there had been some interest about me talking about um, my first experience on the Eastern Shore with the Academy of Arts. Yeah, (laughs) we definitely want to ask you. And the funny thing is that's um, actually about 50 years ago, so. (laughs) Great, that'd be awesome. (laughs) It's not like it's a fresh memory. (laughs) No, it's not a a fresh memory, but yeah, you can look at where where they are today and. It's unbelievable, the change. Just hold, just hold, Henry, just hold that for the, for the interview, if you don't mind. <laughs> Hi, Marie. Hey. It's always nice when we get pleasantly surprised with a fun podcast. Well, I think that is your MO, too, because I, I think you like coming in hot and like not knowing anything, because you're like, just teach me. Just teach me what you ha- about yourself. <laughs> I like that perspective because I'm like, you know, doing all this homework because I want to learn some preliminary stuff. But well, I know. think I think you're yeah, you started out with the preliminary on this gentleman who we interviewed today. And if I I do not want to take over the podcast though. Am I taking over the podcast? Don't from you? Is that was that? No. I don't want to change your train of thought. No, a lot of, not at all. I you know I definitely can appreciate you know pulling a thread, especially you know there's so many. I get so like engrossed in the conversation sometimes I have to be like hey you know right. there's people listening <laughs> and wanting to uh hear you ask some more questions so. we yin and yang together pretty well then would you yes, say yes yes I do believe we do all right. and I do believe that you and Jess do as well so it's all fun this is Henry Cow. it's our interview with Henry Cow coming right up have a listen Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Plenary Eastern Podcast. My name is Tim Wagon, and I'm here with... Marie Nuttall. Marie, good to have you back in the hot seat today. Yay. This interview we're getting ready to do. Um, today, we are with another artist that I don't know anything about, um, although I love his name. I think it's like one of the coolest... There's got to be some historical reference to this gentleman's name. I feel like I've read it in history books my whole life. We are talking today <laughs> with Henry Coe. Um, Henry, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Henry. And thanks for saying that about my name, but I think that when you compare it to like another artist's name, like Wolf Kahn, yeah. it doesn't quite have the same cachet. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to be like uh, Coyote Co. or something like that, I guess. <laughs> right. uh, is, There's still time. <laughs> still, yeah, still time. Is, is there an English reference that I'm... Jog, is, your name is jogging in my mind. Do you know anything about the history of the Co name? Um, yeah, it's not actually all that great, but I think if you go way back in English history, the Co name is synonymous with the name Cook. Um, we did have a family crest which consisted of cuckoo birds. I'm not sure how that came about. Uh, I also know that there is, this might be some, one reason why you know of it, there is a Henry Coe State Park okay. in uh, California, okay. which unfortunately so I, I have no connection with whatsoever. <laughs> I knew there was something. I you knew just it claim a, it anyway. We're going to look up Henry Coe State Park and see what that guy got, <laughs> how he got a state park. And this Henry Coe didn't. <laughs> what did he do? Anyway, Henry, welcome to the show. Thank you. Where do we want to start? I, you know what I'm really interested in, um, Henry, is t- can you tell us about artist residency and what that entails. I was peeping at your website and see that right. you have artist residencies in China and at least three in France. What right. What is, does that entail? Well, the first one, the one in China, which was um, in 1982 and 1983 and actually lasted for seven months, 
I actually wrote, wasn't sure what to call it. I don't know whether it would really be called a residency. It actually involved Harry Hughes was the governor of Maryland at the time, and we he developed a sister state relationship with a province in China, Anhui province. And they really wanted to invite someone over to spend six or seven months there painting. I happened to be in the right place at the right time. Wow. Um, and they asked me to do it. And so, of course, I jumped at the chance. Um, and it, it was really a, a terrific experience. Um, I traveled through a lot of parts in Anhui and in other parts of China. And then I, when I left China, I spent five months traveling through Southeast Asia. So I spent about a year away painting in Asia. Really good experience. But wow. the other three that occurred in France were, I think, more typical residencies. The first one was one that was actually set up by Maryland Institute in connection <clears throat> with a woman named Elizabeth Klotz, whose husband was Trafford Klotz. He was a fairly well-known Maryland painter uh, of the 20th century, and he had a chateau in Brittany. And she wanted to find a way to maintain the chateau, so she connected up with the Institute and started inviting artists over. And I went over there with a couple of other artists and painted for two months. That was terrific, too. And while there, she told me about a French residency that was in another part of Brittany. And I applied to that, ended up doing it twice, and also at the same time got to know a family that had a couple of little houses for rent and sort of set up a relationship with them. And I would go back every year and I still have art supplies over there. They keep my easel and a bunch of other things. And Aww. whenever I want to come back, it's, you know, fine with them. So that makes it easy to travel. That's good. You don't have to pack up anything. You just hop in the plane. Well, and yeah, especially all those really things. It really made a huge difference after a while because when you're carting all your supplies over there, it uh, gets to be a big hassle. <laughs> so yeah. being able to keep stuff there, it's like having a little studio over there. And I unfortunately, I haven't been there for several years because – as my kids have grown, I have felt too guilty to go over there by myself. So <laughs> we were actually all set to make a trip right before the pandemic hit. And we had gotten tickets. They had passports. The whole family of five was going to go. And then the pandemic hit and oh, we well. had to cancel. Ah. So hopefully we'll still get to go over there because they sure want to go. By the time they get to go they might be middle aged though <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well uh henry how long have you been i mean it sounds like you've been i know we're going to talk about the academy art museum and a story you have from 50 years ago but are, you've been painting your whole life yeah i have i mean i i always liked to draw when i was a kid uh when i went to college i majored in english but i minored in art this was in virginia and my art teacher, um, she knew a guy who lived in the mountains outside of Roanoke named George Solanovich. He was a Russian painter, illustrator. And she used to take us to this incredible house he had up in the mountains. And we used to have art classes there. And he was, um, he was a master technician. I think he even illustrated for Disney. Um, his, he had these fantastic techniques that were, you know, really eye-opening to me, were just things I hadn't seen. Like so, like what? What would be, I mean, if you could, you know, I don't want you to... Well, it's a technique you still see today and actually see it quite widely used. It's it's basically called a pull-off off technique where you put on a, a, very, a fairly light uh, kind of medium-heavy um, solution of paint onto the canvas and then you use a very sharp instrument, like a very fine... A sharp brush or other instrument to pull the paint off and create your highlights. And it's just a very interesting way of working, which I sort of over the years kind of would come back to incorporate it and somewhat into my own painting. Now, when you say you always like to draw um, when you were younger, was there something that you, like you get it, so you're sitting around, you know, and you're going to draw something. And like, I always start with a 3D box. 
if I'm in a meeting and I'm, you know, I love to draw and like do, doodle around, but I always start with the same thing. The same, it's always a 3D box. It's the only thing I can think that actually looks three three dimensional, which I like. And then it turns into circles and I make faces in it. And uh, did you, when you were, did you doodle around like that? Did you ever start with one thing oh, I, I, and, then, and then sort of like progress? Well, I think at probably at about the age 12, I was fairly obsessed with old cars. So I drew those all the time. Uh-huh. First, I just drew them in profile because I didn't have any understanding of perspective. But eventually I started to turn them a little bit to make them a little more three-dimensional. But then after that, I actually just got interested in drawing faces. And I would copy any face out of a magazine or a newspaper. Um and really continued with an interest in that for a long time. And actually, both my parents, my mother used to do watercolors. And she was, um, they were kind of small, very simple things, but they were well done. Mm-hmm. And I think that had some influence on me. My father started out wanting to be an architect, but switched to something else. But he did have a, a drawing ability mm-hmm. that was, you know, I think influential also. But after after I majored in English in college, I decided I wanted to have more to do with art. So I got into Maryland Institute and started taking graduate uh, courses and eventually got a graduate degree from them and then wound up on the Eastern Shore. That's Uh, wonderful. That's that's great. Again, we've talked to a lot of people who who started out as graphic designers or or, architects, architects, that type of thing. So it's always interesting to hear when somebody went, went kind of straight at it. And then were was the, the the question that Jess would ask would be like was it a success for you when you first started? No, I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I the institute had an employment service which I went to, and that's where I discovered about the job at the Academy of Arts. And no, no, we we're had talking always, about the, the Academy of Arts here in Easton. In Easton, that's what it was called, uh-huh. the Academy of Arts. Right. And um, so I came down here and. Uh, down there, and they hired me at, you know, the breathtaking sum of seven thousand dollars a year, which hey, that's good money. I wow, was, hey, that's incredible. Good money. <laughs> I never even conceived of so much money. Henry, what was so, the ti- what was your title? I was curator. Ooh. Nice. I, I was I was the second curator. The first curator was a guy named Wayne Neal, and fortunately, he was still living in the area, and he helped me out a lot. But I I also I taught some classes, and I taught courses at Chesapeake College, but unfortunately, I really had no idea what I was doing, because I, I was only, <laughs> I really was just learning how to paint, uh-huh. but it was on the Eastern Shore where I started to paint landscapes and realized that the Eastern Shore, to me, was like, it was like a Dutch painting, the traditional Dutch painting, which has a low horizon and about three-fifths sky was what I saw all around me, and that started really appealing really appealing to me so how long how long were you at the academy not that long i, I guess what years se- what, what 72 year? i came down in the summer of 72 mm-hmm. they hired me i moved down and then i sometime in 74 i quit i kept on teaching for a while but i really wanted to try to concentrate on my own painting so i stayed on the eastern shore for 10 or 12 years and just worked at a lot of different odd jobs. So you came by the Avalon back in the day and that sort of thing. Right. Did you hang out at Carpenter Street in St. Michael's? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and there, a... there were a few other places, too, in St. Michael's to hang out. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, that's great. So then then you came back and you, you, you found, were you surprised, you know, 18 years ago when you heard about uh, Plenair Easton, uh, uh, the painting competition well, that we do here? That's another interesting, I had sort of, I hadn't done any plain air competitions and I knew about plain air Easton. And as a matter of fact, one time I was, um, I was doing a painting in Roxana, Delaware, a big painting and a woman came by and stopped and she said, you should take that over to plain air Easton and enter it, you know? And I thought, well, they probably wouldn't accept, you know, me just walking in and entering the painting. So I doubt I can do that. But it really took a long time before I finally applied. The first time was 2016, and I was lucky enough to get in. But the reason I did was because, I don't know if you've heard of Gary Pendleton's book, uh, 
a hundred plein air painter, painters in the Mid Atlantic region. No, I haven't, I haven't heard of that. Go have to look I that was up. in that book, and they I met a lot of the other people who were in that book, and a lot of them were plein air painters who went into these competitions. So that that made me decide to try it, and it's I'm glad I have because it certainly has turned out to be a you know, a situation in which you can really sharpen your skills and meet a lot of terrific artists. And we're going to ask a couple more questions before we get a break here real quick. But Yeah, so wait, Henry, can I just go back to like that time frame between your um, Academy art gig and at like, was plein air even a thing back then? I mean, were oh, yes. artists like That's... hanging out outside and... Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. it, it was a thing and people were doing it. People... The classes I taught at the academy, people wanted to go outside and paint. Oh, and the nice. academy, which I really thought of as not much more than an art club, you know, with their own little private collection of paintings, there were a lot of artists there who were, you know, they were good painters. And they were going out and painting, you know. So then you then um, you come back in 2016 and then you could talk about the, the changes in the town were... Uh, go ahead. Well, I mean... I could still see small town Easton and I could still see, you know, the sort of that beautiful thing of the little various little towns, Oxford, St. Michael's, Tillman Island. Um, but at the same time, it had just grown so much. Everything was grown. Right. You know, everything was developed. And, I, I love it here. Absolutely love it here. And the big thing I say, cause I got here in 86 and one of the big things is probably right around the time you were leaving, you'd just been left gone a couple of years, but, um, the uh, the trees grew in town like if you, you know it's really tree lined now and like the I don't remember when they except when they, now they're taking them all down yeah because they're because <laughs> they're, they're too big yeah they're, they're they're uplifting the sewer <laughs> water and electric lines but, that's why they're doing so well <laughs> right <laughs> yeah, right right um, so Henry uh, we're gonna uh, take a break after this question what is plein air to you you sound like you were into it early you know this came to us eighteen or nineteen years ago. Um, and I don't, maybe there were people over at the Academy at that time, even who were painting on plein air, but we, we were new to it. What, what does plein air mean to you in terms of its def broad, tight definition, whatever, what, what do you, to you as someone who's done it for a long, long time? Yeah, I have. I mean, it, it's always been the thing that's most attracted me to painting because it's the easiest way to directly deal with the changing light of any given time. If you're working from a photograph, it's totally static, and the decisions are kind of already made for you. If a plein air painting to me is when you're outside and you have to deal with all of those changes in a very immediate sense. The sun's going down, the clouds are changing, the wind's blowing, bugs are getting in the painting, you know, people are coming up and talking. All these different things are going on and they're forcing you to make decisions really quickly like if I try to do a painting in the studio, I can sit in a chair in front of it for six hours and not do anything, you know. Mm -hmm. But when you're out there and it's all happening right in front of you, you have to make those decisions immediately. And I think basically that's a good thing. So yeah. are you are you an artist that will revisit the same space over and over again, or because of those factors, that's not really your how, how you best approach a painting? You mean the same subject matter? Right. Like like there's a tree behind you. Like will you go back and visit that tree like hanging up yeah. next day or are you, or you know in your mind or are you thinking, well, there's no way the clouds are going to be anywhere near it or even if you went at the same time. I mean, like you said, the sky can be incredibly right. different from day right. to day. Well, because I like to paint fairly large, I mean, for a long time I was painting outside doing paintings that were about 4 feet by 6 feet. I would start by making a small painting, uh, the same ratio of sizes, and get some idea for the sky. And then I would start the big painting and come back every day at the same time. You know, and yes, sometimes this, the weather wasn't the same, uh, but sometimes you get lucky, you might have a string of four or five days in a row that right. were the same. And that that's the way I would work it. And then I would use the the sky study in the studio if I had to, you know, adjust things. But a lot of times, you know, I would end up painting whatever the sky was at the time. 
you know, becomes a dialogue where you, you're making marks on the canvas and things are happening to you at the same time. And it's kind of a give and take that you try to keep up with. Um, that's, that's, but, go ahead, go ahead. I, I'm just going to say the hard thing, you know, you, you do at some point have to bring it back inside and look at it because outside you're dealing with the glare of the sun, the, you know, light and shade and glare coming across the painting. And after a while, I find, especially now that I'm getting older, I can't really see it anymore. <laughs> I have to bring it back in and just look at it right. to see what I'm doing. You know, Is there a time of year that you prefer over other times? Like I know sometimes in the middle of the summer, like the sky can just be a weird shade of sort of gray for it's <laughs> you know it's not like the sun is <laughs> out but it's think. so yeah. humid and thick and the air yeah. is just thick outside that it's just not clear it's not like san diego's clear sky right so is there a time yeah. of year that well I mean, the sky is better for you well i love the fall and and the winter um i'd say that november and december the Sun is going has gone really far south. The shadows are really, really long. Mm -hmm. The sun doesn't get up that far north. So the shadows are long and they're dark. And I really love that period because everything is so clearly delineated. Um, but yeah, I think a you know a, a sky that's got activity in it with clouds and there's nothing like an oncoming storm to paint in. Yeah. Probably unless you get caught out in it, you know, <laughs> which has happened plenty of times. But it certainly makes for an interesting subject. But yeah, I know what you're talking about, Marie, with that that kind of, it's almost like a yellowish white light and there's nothing else. Right. You know, it's just the grayness over everything. Yeah. Well, it's I very mean, hard to paint. In our defense, in San Diego, you would only see blue all the time. So I, mean, I know, but sometimes I miss I miss the blue. We get, we get or plenty when of I do blue around here. It. Again, if you're dealing with your realtor, we get plenty of blue around here as well. <laughs> we um, we're gonna take a short break. Uh, we'll be right back with a delightful conversation with Henry Coe. Just one second. The 18th annual Plein Air Easton Competition and Festival takes place July 15th through the 24th, 2022 when 58 of the top planner artists of our time will spend one week in Easton, Maryland, competing for thousands of dollars in prizes. Immerse yourself in a week of art exhibits, receptions, free demos, and panel discussions. Purchase exceptional and brand new art for that blank wall. Come for the art and make your summer memories at Plein Air Easton. The full event schedule can be found online at pleinairesteon.com. You all for joining us again, Marie. I think you have a very interesting question um, that you want to start off, Henry, with here. Yes, I just I, I want to know because you have such an extensive career, Henry, and like that that liaison between um, plein air painting, you know, back in the early academy days when you were there, and then today's like competitive painting was that notion of painting competitively just so off the wall or, or like how did how did people that were professional artists view this onslaught of hey now we're gonna like all compete against each other <laughs> well I think I'd have to say that I I'm I'm it was slightly lied earlier because I the first planar event of mine was in 2016 it was actually back when I lived on the eastern shore and there was a painting competition at the Maritime Museum in St. Michael's. Oh, see, there you go. And yeah, and I entered that, and I think even won a prize. But that was probably the first actual plein air event. And oh my goodness! Quite a few, quite a few paint. No, I mean for me, We've I'm got to rewrite it. history. Well, right we'll here. have to do some <laughs> digging and find out. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do think I would say something about the competition thing. I mean, I can remember. In 2016, hearing a lot of people talk about plein air painting as the new golf, and I just thought, "Whoa, no, it's not a sport." You know, it may be a competition, but this is not a sport. You know, this is something totally different. 
And I think it's kind of a disservice to the, I mean, you look at the really good painters who were, who are putting themselves out there and doing it. Uh, it's really a pretty serious thing. And, and I'm amazed at some of the work that some people are able to come up with, you know, not just in planar competitions, but in a two hour quick draw. Yeah. You know, it usually takes me a lot more time than that to come up with, you know, anything decent. So. Do you participate in the quick draws? I do, but I think I've done one quick draw in which I won a second prize, and that's it. Because mm-hmm. usually, I two hours usually just isn't enough. It's not, I, I, not need, I need about three hours, uh-huh, you know, gotcha. really to get something going. Right. I think the golf comparison was just because uh, it was so hot, and you were out in it, and then I think also it had something to do with. George W. Bush and how he had made a comment that he didn't take up golf when he retired from the presidency, that he took up painting. And I think that was a weak sort of metaphor that people were kind of using back then. But <laughs> now he paints now he paints in the shower, so maybe <laughs> Yikes. maybe that's the new place for <laughs> plein air painting. <laughs> He's painting in the shower? Is that wow. Yeah, he has done paintings in the shower. Well, I guess I if you're know. president, I, there's nowhere else to go but painting paintings in the shower, maybe. I don't know. I can't unimagine that. I, I restrict myself <laughs> to singing in the shower. Yeah, you're, you're sticking to singing. <laughs> I, I want to go back to this this thing where you talk about, like, it's a dialogue between you and the painting or whatever. Right, you know, right. What, yeah, what, I'd be happy to talk about that. Yeah, what, what, do, you, what do you... Well, I mean, it, the to me, this is what has always amazed me about painting. You start out with a blank canvas. I mean, you can have a four by six foot canvas, just a blank white space, and you can put one dab of paint on it, and that changes everything. The dialogue actually starts right there, because just making that one dab of paint, you've completely altered that surface. Okay. You know, things are starting to happen. You can put some, another color next to it, or the same color, and things begin to happen. I, I find this to be very true in plain air painting, particularly when I'm working outside. And it's probably one of the things that really excites me the most is that I can take a large canvas outside, it's completely blank, and eventually I'm going to have something on it that's a whole image that exists in and of itself, you know, outside of the subject that I painted. Because once you take it away from that subject, to me it's got nothing to do with the subject, it exists on its own. And that's what's so great about it, you know, and the whole way of getting there is the conversation. You you may start out with a particular thing that you want. And this is one of the problems of painting to me is that I can spend too much time driving around because I have an idea in my head of what I want to put on the canvas. And so I'm looking for it. Right. And that almost never succeeds. You know, it's just becomes a big driving waste of time. It's best to be open to what's out there and say, okay, that's a possibility. Stop and set up and start working with that, you know? So So there's a back and forth constantly, you know, that just starts with a plain white surface. So I'm going to turn this conversation a little bit. We are doing a, a play right now, and I talk to the actors about this all the time, where, you know, it's really about the questions that you're going to ask yourself in the meantime between rehearsals that are going to shape what you're going to do at the rehearsal time. There's a, you it's acting is is a lot about what, you know, so many questions about what you're trying to, you know, you have a vision in your head of how you want to play something on stage. Um, And, you know, there's a technique with with, with how, with how to get there. You you have to learn how to hold the brush. You have to learn how to mix paint. You have to learn how to do those things. But where you're really going to put the performance out is the stuff that you do, when you're just thinking about the character and what, why the character says this, you know, because, and what were they doing before they got into the scene that you're actually watching? And it's, those are the questions, everything, you know, that you can think about possibly like why this person is in this situation. Right. Is that the dialogue that you're talking about sort of going on with your, with, with yourself? And, and do you get frustrated in it uh, still? Oh, Absolutely. Uh, well, I think it's that, and it's also the dynamic that would exist between, depending on who the other actors are, you know, like, 
you know, if a, if another person is playing a particular part, how is that, that going to affect the part you're playing? You know, it's right. the same way with the dynamic of the elements of a landscape. Okay, good. Okay, you know, good. how how am how am I going to am I going to just paint exactly what I see, or am I going to take something out and put something in, uh, move something over, rearrange it? You know, right. And is there the, are all questions that come up. I'm sorry. Is the goal to convey that conversation, that discussion to um, to the buyer? Is yeah, it okay I, for them to have a different oh, absolutely. discussion with yeah. the painting? Absolutely. Totally. Yeah, I would encourage that. I mean, you know, if, if somebody comes up and just says to me, well, that that painting gives me a really good feeling. That's all I need, you know? Right. That's all I'm looking for. Now, if somebody buys it, that's great. But, you know, it's just the satisfaction that it, it means something to somebody, but it, it doesn't have to mean the same thing. Right. It resonated you know? with them on some I mean, it's level. Like a, a painter that I like, a lot of people like, is Edward Hopper. And Hopper said that he just wanted to paint the light on the side of a house, you know, and I think that's an amazing comment. It's just, you know, that's just, it's just a, you know, a physical thing. He's going to learn how to paint light and shadow on the side of a house and that's it. But when you look at his paintings, there's so much more there than that. You know, there's a whole feeling of the isolation of people in early 20th century America and all that's coming out just because Hopper wanted to go paint the light on the side of a house. Right. And you can see that, you know, you see those late afternoon light and shadow on the side of some clabbered house in New England. It evokes a tremendous feeling, you know, that's what he's getting at. Who but else, he never talked about it. Who else inspires you, Henry? Well, another contemporary of his, Charles Birchfield, who I think also Hopper really liked as a painter because Hopper wrote about him. Um, you know, his work, his work started out somewhat along the lines of this kind of isolated Depression era feeling of 20th century America. But then he kind of went off into a, a tangent that kind of celebrated, the, I don't know, a sort of fantasy of nature. It completely changed. And he did it all in watercolor. But yeah, he's, he's a really interesting painter. How many paintings I'm, have you made, uh, uh, Henry? How many? Yeah, 7,000. <laughs> I have no idea. 10,000, 20,000 paintings. <laughs> you still love it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Why do you love it? You're uh, meant to do it, obviously. I mean, Well, I mean, I don't exactly know why I love it. I just know that when I'm doing it, I feel like I'm doing what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. And it, it used to be a long time ago, I felt like, I would go outside and paint because it was a way to participate in the day. You know, I wouldn't be sitting inside not doing anything and not knowing what the day was like outside. I'd be outside and the sun would be going over, the shadows would be getting longer, and I'd be out there in it. And that was all I had to do, you know. Right. And I think it's always sort of stemmed from something like that, right? you know. Um, and Henry, you know, if Edward, Edward Hopper said, I was just trying to paint the light on the side of a house. Yeah, well, he said, he said that's all he really wanted to do. If you were yeah. to say what Henry Coe, all he really wanted to do, what would Henry Coe say? I, I don't know. I mean, as soon as I said it, I would say, no, it's, that's not it. You know, but <laughs> right. I think it's very hard to be pinned down. But I, I think I want. You know, uh, uh, I, I don't need to be painting the Rockies. I don't need to paint the Grand Canyon. I'd rather paint the sort of day-to-day -day things one sees in the rural America that surrounds me. But within that rural America, I'd like to find a little bit of mystery, you know. How do you do that in a painting? How do you do that? I think you do it with the light. You know, I think uh, all of us painters, especially planar painters, we're chasing the light, you know, it, it is in the light, it's in the light and the shadow, you know. And the, the one thing I, with going to France and painting, 
that I think the one thing that was brought home to me there about the Impressionists and people before the Impressionists like Charles Delvin Yee and Camille Corot, it's not just that they were painting the light, they were painting the actual air between themselves and the object they were looking at. You know, so they were kind of painting the light in the space between them and the things they were painting. Oh, wow. And that's like what Monet's trying to do when he's painting haystacks and cathedrals, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like not, not the object itself, but the space between them and all that light coming through there. It's just a way of uh, seeing. And I, I felt like, I don't know whether this is the case in France, but I felt like the atmosphere was more palpable, you know. Like it was more, you could almost feel it a lot, you know. Kind of like Easton know in it. July, Henry. <laughs> Doesn't it feel like you can kind of feel the air? It's so heavy. Well, yeah, you wear the <laughs> air like, in it's July. like Maine is another place I love to paint. You you can go up to Maine and it can be foggy and misty, and you can, you know, you, you can practically reach out and hold the air. Mm -hmm. It's so thick. But you can also have those days in Maine where you can be looking at islands that seem to be a mile away, but they're. They're so dark and crystal clear. They're, it's like they're right in front of you. It's like you can't see the air between because it's so clear. The sky is an incredible blue. You know, I find That's those cool. different things really fascinating. But well, painting the air yeah. has a yeah, long way it. from, from uh, making a 3D box. I'll say that much. <laughs> I mean, it, and it really is, uh, you know, it, it, it is wonderful to to talk to you, you artists uh, the artists that come on the show and to um to eventually see the work you know like we're seeing now in your background and you know throughout the festival and throughout the year uh how you do what you do and um, so uh painting the air i mean i could go into you know well i know there's a technique for that right i mean i know we were talking to the guy who who i think won an award last year who was, said he'd spent he bought a particular type of paint and oil to get the shine off of the water, and he'd been trying to do it for he was been working on it for a year or so, trying to do that. I mean, is trying to paint the air a, a hard? I mean, you're not just painting blue, right? I mean, no, no, you're not. Well, you really have to think in terms of the space between things, the and space depth. between. You know, the position you're in and what you're viewing, whether it's, you know, aerial perspective, which refers to things that are far away that you're going to sort of diffuse and soften. They're not going to have any hard edges. They're going to have very soft edges. And then as you come into the foreground, the optics are going to be more clearly defined and less diffuse. You know, it brings up another painter, a 19th century American painter that I I've liked all the whole period I've been painting, and that's George Innes, who was really a master of the edges of things, of when to show an edge and when to lose it in the things around it. And he was a master of the, the light and shadow, the late afternoon light that falls across a landscape and creates these areas where suddenly something pops out quite clearly you know, like a figure in the distance. But then another thing farther back, maybe it's a cow, maybe it's another figure you can't really tell. You know, because that's really the way we see things. You know, we're not seeing everything in all this detail. That's, to me, it's one of the problems with painting from photographs. Everything is too clear, you know, but we don't, when we're looking at a landscape, we don't see it that way. You right, know? right. And then, yet there still is uh, uh, sort of an awe that comes about me sometimes, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, when you see something that is painted, ex oh, my God, it looks like a picture. You know, I guess, so I get that side of it, too. Um, but, again, that is not what exactly what, what plein air is about, correct? Correct, yeah. Although, you know, there are people who still, there's a painter named Rackstraw Downs, who paints in New York and Texas, and he um, he's an English painter. He's been in this country for a long time. He paints large landscapes outside in the city that he'll spend months on. Mm -hmm. And if you look at them, like some people say, wow, that's incredibly photogra photographic, but it's more than that. It's almost hyper-realistic. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, they're just incredibly intricate and really quite amazing. Right. You know. Right. So, I mean, I think there's room for everything in painting. It's just that for me, I like the kind of, you know, the effects that soften and harden and kind of change back and forth as they recede into the distance. That's wonderful. Have yeah, I think I do too. Yeah. I like the suggestion of, uh, you know, a cow rather than the highly detailed, you know, if you get yeah. real, like really close to it, then you're like, I'm not really sure what that is, but you step away and you're like, whoa, that is really cool. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, yeah, I love when you can go, you see, like some paintings are meant to be down a long hallway and you're like, oh, wow, it looks incredible. And it changes as you get closer. I yeah. really like the concept you're talking about. Like, well, once you take a palette <laughs> or, or a, a board or whatever you paint on or your canvas and you put one dot in the center of it, it's all changed. That's really, really interesting, yeah. you know, too, as well. Um, so, uh, Henry, we're getting ready to go with rapid fire here. This oh, is our rapid fire serious. section. First, first, first thing that comes to mind, Henry. First thing that comes, this is Marie's little, Is this uh, kind of like Stephen Colbert questionnaire thing? Yeah, yeah, you could, yeah, take your time with it. Yes, you could, yes, yes. <laughs> You're going to ask me what my favorite sandwich is? <laughs> What's your favorite sandwich, Henry? <laughs> oh, that would be, um... I'd say a grilled haddock sandwich. You can get it up at a little place in Maine. Nice, nice. <laughs> I, I won't say. mention it because it'll be flooded with people. <laughs> That's not something you find around <laughs> around here. <laughs> um, Henry, first thing that comes to your mind if I say the term overrated. Oh, God. Boy. You're thinking about it too much. No, no, no that's good. I've that. obviously thought he, about it way he's, too he's, much. He's, he's, <laughs> He's auditioning for the Colbert show. <laughs> um, yeah, it doesn't have to be art related. It can be, you know, social media or, you know. I, well, that's what I was thinking. I don't want to feed you. <laughs> social media. <laughs> I would say the internet, too. Oh, I know what I would say. Information. Uh, yeah, how so? Well, we get too much of it. And, and a lot of it's not real. Right. You know, we get it on the internet. You, know, you can get all sorts of information that isn't real. I'm constantly telling this to my kids. <laughs> <laughs> is it real? Is it true? Is it necessary? I mean, son, that's not real. <laughs> well, I mean, when my, you know, when my kids are looking at YouTube videos and thinking this is, this person has uh, a million followers, so they must be credible. <laughs> overrated. Not necessarily. Overrated. Totally overrated. You hear that, Zuckerberg? Um... <laughs> We talked about your season. Uh, tell us a chore that you despise. I would rather you ask me a chore that I like. <laughs> <laughs> what, what chore do you like? Well, you can hate chopping on chores. Wood. I mean, I'm sorry. What do you What do you like? Chopping wood. Chopping wood. You like chopping wood? Okay, so go the opposite of that. That would be one you hate. Cleaning out a bathroom. That, that's yeah. a good one. That's a good one, Henry. That's a good one. <laughs> My wife's not going to like hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell us one person you would love to um, ha meet at a dinner party, deceased or, or alive. Uh, Charles Dickens. Oh. <laughs> not the painter. No. Is there, <laughs> there is a painter. Remember, remember, I was an English major in college. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's your favorite Dickens? We do. We've, I've, I've done Christmas Carol here about 15 times here. Uh -huh. um, I just I, I love it, and I've never really read anything else by him. I'm not a well-read person. Um, what is your what 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 do you love about Dickens? Um, his well, for one thing, he has a great sense of humor, mm -hmm. which to me goes a long way in any book. Um, he's an excellent writer. He, if you look at the descriptions of his scenes, like in the early part of uh, Tale of Two Cities, it's like he's He's presaging the camera, motion pictures. Mm -hmm. You know, he's describing a, a, a carriage going through the mud on a rainy night. And it's so vivid, right. you could picture it in a movie, you know. And I think a lot of early directors probably looked at this stuff and set up their shots that way. Right, right. That was very cool. What's next, Marie? Um, are you more an optimist or a realist? I don't know. If I was a realist, I probably would never have decided to become an artist. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. 
Would you yeah. rather invest in a dream home or travel the world? Travel the world. Definitely. That's my guy. Henry, it's been great talking to you. We really appreciate you coming on. Well, it's been really fun. Uh, was it as bad as you thought it was going to be? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't torture you too badly, did we? No, no. I thought it was great. <laughs> it was a lot less uh, painful than I thought it would be. Good, 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 good. good. <laughs> Well, uh, we hope you all have enjoyed this uh, session to this podcast with uh, Henry Coe. It's been great getting to know you, Henry. We, like I said, we see people around, but we never really get to to talk to them much during the festival. So it's, that's right. been a real treat for us to be able to do that um, throughout the last probably 10 or 15 podcasts we've done. What is your um, – tell the listeners your website, Henry, so they can learn more. It's just henrycoe.com. Not to be confused with the Henry Coe State Park dot com. Right. <laughs> well, if if they want to get that domain, they're going to have to pay. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to have to pay big bucks. Right. <laughs> Henry, thank you very much. We'll talk thank to you, you again. We'll Enjoy see you soon. Talking to you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Henry. The Plein Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation and was produced by Nick Richards. Our theme music was generously provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can learn more about Plan Air Easton at planairisten.com.